It's time to mess with our minds by messing with our eyes. Believe it or not, neither this picture nor this one is moving. I swear to you, they are completely still images. Yet when I stare at it, like, like that thing's just moving. This of course is a classic example of a visual illusion. Now illusions aren't just for fun, they're actually really well studied in psychology. Why? Well, illusions force the brain to make decisions about ambiguous images, and that actually reveals a lot about how we perceive the world around us. We're gonna have a look at five types of illusions in this lesson, starting with this one. There's the image, and here's the question. Which of those two yellow lines is longer? Now, most healthy visual systems will say that this line up here is slightly longer than this one. And in fact, you see that effect even more if we add just a few more lines, a few more lines to this image. It really, really gives the impression that this line is longer. But of course, as you might already know, those two yellow lines are the exact same length. This is the Ponzo illusion in which the upper horizontal line is pretty much always perceived as being longer. Why is the Ponzo illusion interesting? Well, it shows how our brain uses depth cues to process images. For example, linear perspective and height in the visual field, even if it leads to inaccurate interpretations. And so even if you try and fight it, your brain's thinking, oh, those could be converging parallel lines. And because that line's a little bit higher, closer to the horizon, it could actually just be longer than this one. Our next illusion, the Muller lie, is a little bit similar to the Ponzo illusion. We're also comparing two lines, vertical ones this time, and asking the question, which one is longer? As your brain might be telling you, the line with the feather tails, that's the one sticking out. It's usually perceived as being longer than these arrow-headed lines. It's another fascinating optical illusion, but of course here in psychology we're interested in seeing if we can explain why that's the case. Two theories have been put forward to try and explain this theory, the carpentered world hypothesis and the perceptual compromise theory. Gregory suggests that the Mullalai illusion involves a misapplication of one of our perceptual constancies, saying that our brain might interpret the lines as corresponding to features of buildings or rooms, so perhaps something like this. So because we're familiar with what a carpentered world looks like, we see those images and our brain corresponds them to like corners and edges of rooms and we think, oh yeah, this corner is sort of like farther away from us than this one is. So the height of the room is probably like taller in this one. This was further supported when the illusion was shown to Zulu people who live in round huts without many straight lines and edges. They didn't perceive the lines to be of different lengths. The other theory to explain the Mulalaya illusion is the perceptual compromise theory. And it goes something like this. On our retinas, these two vertical lines are exactly the same, but the arrowhead or the feather tail creates a sort of like open figure that the brain just automatically applies the gestalt principle of closure to, creating these sort of closed images as shown by the added blue lines. Now, because of this perceptual compromise made, we perceive each figure to sort of be like the length of the average black and blue lines instead of the original, resulting in us thinking that this vertical line has to be longer than this one here. Now have a look at this picture. There are no camera tricks or any like CG going on here. If you were standing at the exact spot that the camera was, this is exactly what you would see. Now I've seen stuff like this before, but it still gets me every time. This is the Ames room illusion and it's done by using a fake room. Well, it's real, but not real as we're used to. It's a room specially designed just to prove that we maintain shape constancy at the expense of size constancy. You see, the Ames room is actually a trapezoid, but when viewed from the right angle, looks like a regular right angled room. It's such a great and irritating example of how a brain holds on so tightly to room shape constancy that it's willing to ignore human size constancy. So <laughs> I've seen this quite a few times now and it, I just can't get over it. Like those guys are changing in size. My brain's like, no, this is a regular room. It has to be a regular room. Therefore, these people are literally changing size. Why brain, why? Fun fact, the Ames room principle was actually used to create the illusion of different sized people in the first Lord of the Rings movie. Here's large Gandalf the wizard having some tea with a small little hobbit. Uh, but this is actually what the table looked like and that's where the camera was. Next, we're gonna look at impossible figures. So this is an illusion that exploits perceptual cues so that we see stuff that should not be able to exist. A classic example is the Penrose triangle. Yeah, I don't even really need to explain that, do I? The thing is, since we're using a 2D image to represent a 3D object, we can actually use all sorts of visual cues against each other. Artist Brian McKay actually created the Impossible Triangle as an art installation in East Perth in uh, 1999. Uh, this is what it looks like from this angle, but viewed from the right angle, uh, that's the Penrose Triangle right there. Here's another great image that you might be familiar with. It's a piece of art called Relativity, and it was made by M.C. Escher, a Dutch graphic artist whose work in the 
the mid 1900s wowed audiences around the world. He started off with a fascination with tessellations, which are geometrical symmetries of like uh, interlocking repetitive patterns. He was inspired by tiles and architecture in Spain uh, and made dozens of mosaic patterns on, of his own, including this one, um, Eight Heads. Even though he had no mathematical training, Escher's art was strongly influenced by maths. Inspired by the Penrose Triangle, Escher would uh, later create one of his most famous lithographs, this one here called Waterfall. It's a perfect example of a impossible figure. All of the visual cues point to a self-powered, you know, perpetual waterfall. But we know, you know, cognitively that the laws of physics would completely prohibit this. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, just Google Escher and you'll find plenty more. And our final impossible figure is the Necker cube. Uh, this is just 12 simple lines that we instantly recognize as being a cube. Uh, but which way is it facing? Are you seeing this cube like from top down or from bottom up? A mysterious mystery this one is. And finally, ambiguous figures. Um, so these are illusions that exploit visual similarities and the way that we interpret like, you know, little changes. They're also known as reversible images uh, and sort of show us how we can have this thing called multi-stable perception, like seeing different things at the exact same time. Classic example of this is this image uh, called my wife and my mother-in-law. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to see if you can see both images in that picture. But if you're finding it hard to swap between the two, uh, and one of them, the nose is that point over there, and then the other one, this whole bit here, um, is the nose. It's thought that our brain can view these ambiguous figures as whole images because of Gestalt principles. Here are two more examples of ambiguous features, the rabbit duck illusion and Rubens vase. Or vase. Whoa, multi-stable stuff going on right there. So, can you trust what your eyes are telling you? I guess not. And on that note, goodbye.